Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Sharif abdel -Kadus. And welcome, everyone. Now to our top story of the day. One of Afghanistan's most feared warlords has returned to Afghanistan just days before its presidential election. General Abdul Rashid Dostum is one of several warlords who have allied with Afghan President Hamid Karzai, who's seeking a new term. Karzai is hoping Dostum's return will, will help attract ethnic Uzbek voters. On Monday, Dostum addressed a rally in the northern Afghan city of Sherbagan. His message of support for Karzai also contained a warning to his opponents. <laughs> We are hopeful. We are determined. Playing with General Dostom is playing with a million human beings. Playing with General Dostom is playing with a storm. Playing with General Dostom will be tough and will create anger. God willing, we will establish a party in Afghanistan, which will be bigger and stronger within six years, and this party will be able to respond to your demands. And this is what you and your martyrs deserve. Dostum's return to prominence in Afghanistan comes despite his role overseeing a 2001 massacre at Dashti Laili that left at least 2,000 Taliban POWs dead. He's also had extensive ties with the U.S. and was formerly on the CIA payroll. Last month, New York Times reporter James Risen revealed the Bush administration blocked at least three federal investigations into the alleged war crimes committed by Dostum. Risen spoke about his findings on Democracy Now! The evidence was overwhelming that something had happened and that it was the responsibility of the Bush administration to look into this or at least to push for an international investigation because Dostum had been on the CIA payroll, was part of a U.S.-backed alliance that was taking over Afghanistan. And what I found was time after time in, in, in different agencies and, as far as, and in the White House, uh, Bush administration officials repeatedly ignored evidence or just decided or discouraged efforts to open investigations into uh, the uh, massacre. After the new findings came to light, CNN's Anderson Cooper asked President Obama about opening a new investigation into the Bush administration's alleged cover-up. Some were suffocated in a steel container, others were shot, possibly buried in mass graves. Would you support, would you call for an investigation into possible war crimes in Afghanistan? Yeah, you know, the, uh, the uh, indications that this had not been properly investigated just recently was brought to my attention. So what I've asked my national security team to do is to collect the facts for me that are known, uh, and we'll probably make a decision in terms of how to per, uh, approach it uh, once we have all the facts gathered up. But you wouldn't resist categorically an investigation? I, I think that you know there are responsibilities that all nations have, even in war. And if it uh, appears that our conduct in some way supported uh, violations of the laws of war, then I think that uh, you know, we have to know about that. On Monday, the State Department said the Obama administration continues to gather evidence on Dostum's alleged role in the Dashti Laili massacre. Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs P.J. Crowley said the U.S. had expressed, quote, serious concerns to the Afghan government about Dostum's return. For more on the story, we're going to London now, where we're joined by Andrew McKenty. He is an international human rights lawyer who traveled to Afghanistan in the fall of 2002 to investigate the massacre. Andrew is also the former chair of Amnesty International UK. Andy, welcome to Democracy Now! The significance of Dostum's return on the eve of the Afghanistan elections to support President Karzai in his bid to be um, re-elected. Well, I think the, the significance is quite clear if you've ever been to northern Afghanistan, where General Dostum's um, role, I think, this week is to deliver the Uzbek, ethnic Uzbek votes for President Karzai. It's as simple as that. And the best way of doing that is to have him back home in Afghanistan. And you traveled to Afghanistan to investigate this massacre. Describe exactly what happened. These prisoners surrendered. They were transported. Go through uh, the, the events that took place. Well, I'd like to say first that I was, um, I was introduced to this issue by, by the filmmaker and journalist Jamie Doran, who's investigated uh, with his film crew in northern Afghanistan in late 2001 into early 2002. And Jamie approached me in London 
and asked me to look at his, uh, his film footage and other evidence he had to make a human rights assessment, some legal assessment, uh, partly about uh, culpability, responsibilities, partly to help him fill the gaps in the storyline. And very quickly, uh, after reviewing several hours worth of film footage of the gravesite at Dash Delai Lee, uh, of uh, interviews, uh, uh, translated transcripts uh, of the interviews as well, of people who'd been there, people who'd driven the transport, people who'd actually claimed that they had killed some of the prisoners, uh, very quickly the, the, the story held up. Uh, what surprised me, though, was the, the strand which went through, which uh, is, is in some ways the most contentious strand, which is that uh, there was some involvement or at least some responsibility for many of the deaths on the part of U.S. Special Forces who were on the ground at the time as well. Uh, and um, I think that when you look at the story, the story itself is big enough. More than 2,000 people in a mass grave out of one incident that took place, well, it took place over a number of days, but it was one continuing incident. That is big enough in itself for any war, any series of war crimes in any country, in any decade. Uh, the problem with this issue, though, has been precisely the fact that U.S. Special Forces were on the ground and that they had command responsibility. They had command over many of the guys, the Afghan soldiers, who began the killing. And the problem continues to be, and I fully understand the problem that defence departments have and uh, the White House has had over the years, the problem continues to be that over the days when the bodies were rolling out of these trucks in Sheberhan prison, U.S. Special Forces could have stopped it. And the big question for me has always been, why did they not stop it? They had control over the actions of the Afghan soldiers. <clears throat> they were the top of the command structure, and yet they continued to let it happen. They, and it's were a particular, they there? Well, they, at first they denied they were there. Uh, and, and that was uh, interesting because I'd seen photographs showing they were there. And there was other evidence they were there. So the storyline changed and said, well, yeah, they were there, but they weren't there when the trucks rolled through the gates, and they weren't there when the bodies spilled out of the backs of the trucks. And they certainly weren't there when the bodies were being tipped into pits on the edge of the desert. And bit by bit, the evidence seems to show that, in fact, they were there. They did know. They must have known. One of the keys to this is that um, the reason that the two, three thousand um, men who died were being taken from Kalizani to Sheberhan prison before being sent home because the war had finished, the fighting had finished. The reason they were being taken was that U.S. Special Forces interrogators were still looking for Al-Qaeda operatives and they feared that some of the operatives were hiding amongst these guys. So their idea was to identify them, to take them to wherever, which ultimately would have been Guantanamo in some cases, because they were an intelligence asset. And the U.S. Special Interrogators must have known in the first day, at the prison where they were stationed, that hundreds of bodies were spilling out of metal containers, dead through suffocation. Why they didn't then stop that in the subsequent days, when these container trucks were rolling back down to where they began to pick up another batch of prisoners, and rolling back and more spilling out, why they didn't stop it? That, to me, is the big question. Negligence, for sure, but criminal negligence. And finally, uh, General Dostum himself, his role in this massacre, these were his forces, and also his connection to the United States. Yeah, well, this is where it gets a much more... A broader picture shows you just the realities on the ground at the time. Um, the, the whole area of Mazari Sharif, uh, and Sheberhan and so on, were, were vital strategic um, assets for the military forces on each side. So it was imperative for the Allies, United States and their allies, to come in and control the area. And it was very clear from the recent history of Afghanistan that the only way you could do that is if you had General Dostum on your side. Now, General Dostum is a character who, uh, he flips from one side to the other. His allegiance goes depending on whether he'll win if he flips his allegiance or whether he's going to get paid more. So he was paid buckets full of dollars. Uh, over a long period of time, and he was an ally, and he effectively won the war in the north and gained control of the north, Mazari Sharif, Sheberhan, for the U.S. and their allies. 
And that was the importance of Dostum. And uh, because of that military importance, everything else was overlooked. The problem is